Hey, I'm Kevin, and today I'm going to show you how I made this computer desk with mosaic pattern fronts, a kinetic folding door, and much more. We have a lot to cover today, so sit back, relax, and let's build a desk in the KevBot Workshop. As I've stated before in other videos, I typically choose my projects based on my needs. This desk is fulfilling my need for an updated work area, but it also comes at a great time as the Rockler Desk Challenge is going on. The desk I currently have is too old and too small. In designing my new desk, I originally started with a waterfall desk design, which ended up changing due to a miscalculation with my lumber. The final design was a solid oak top with two towers as support. Though I didn't have the waterfall anymore, it all worked out for the best because I was able to make a second cabinet that would house a computer tower or other storage. With the solid oak top, I started the whole process by letting the boards sit in my shop and acclimate before milling them down to size. These 8 quarter boards of white oak will be milled down to their final size of 6 quarter before gluing them up into the tabletop. Before I glue them up, I am drilling holes for the dowels. This will help with alignment. Because this is a big beast of a top, I called in some reinforcements to help. Even though I had some help with this, we ran into some issues. I had a time crunch yesterday and I really wanted to get these in clamps overnight so it could dry. And so I decided to do them all together and that was a poor decision. You know, we were trying to keep up the entire time. We were reapplying glue as it was drying and just don't do it the way I did it. It was just really, really stupid. If you've seen my coffee table build, I actually had a cup in the tabletop and I used breadboard ends to actually keep it flat. With this, I'm going to use C-channel. I'm gonna be placing C-channel in the underside of the desk so that it can keep it flat with any seasonal movement. While I think breadboard ends are great for keeping the top flat, I didn't particularly want them on my desk just for design reasons. You can purchase prefabricated C-channels for this, but I decided to make my own. Plus, this is my first real time working with metal and I would like to do more in the future because I just look so cool while working with it. Okay, maybe not that cool. <laughs> Using my angle grinder, I was able to cut these apart and then do the majority of sanding to clean them up. The point of C-channel is to allow for seasonal movement. To do this, I am cutting elongated slots in the steel so that the fasteners can move freely. After drilling holes, I used my Dremel tool and a cutoff wheel to elongate them and a file to clean them up and soften the edges. To finish these up, I hit them with a coat of paint. Before I install the C-channel, I cut the top down to size. For those who are wondering, the top measures in at 66 inches by 25 inches. To insert the C-channel, I routed using a spiral upcut bit by taking multiple passes to plunge down to my desired depth. Rather than cutting the opening to perfectly fit the C-channel, you make it a little bit longer to leave space for movement. And that fits in there really nice. He's nice! To hold this in place, I am inserting some threaded inserts. Since the white oak is pretty hard stuff, I made sure to cut in and then back up here and there. I then used some CA glue to lock them in place. While adding the bolts, you want to tighten them enough so that it holds it down, but not so tight that nothing can move. The last bolt though, I did tighten down. With doing that, the tabletop can move forward and backwards from one point. Many woodworkers would choose a point in the middle here so that it can go outwards and back, 
but I decided to do it from the back so that the table can go outwards and come back and this will be fixed into place. With the majority of the top done, I could start working on making the carcasses for the towers. I'll be using three quarter inch ply for the carcasses or boxes or towers, whatever you wanna call these. And I will be strategically cutting the sides for a continuous grain. I started by ripping them down to an approximate size to make them a lot more manageable to work with. Using my doorboard and painter's tape to avoid tear out, I cross cut with my circular saw. Now that the sides are much smaller, I can rip them down to their final size and cut a half inch dado to receive the back panel. I cut some hardwood oak strips so that I can edge band the ply. Now there is a reason that I'm doing this before I put the carcass together. Because I edge banded beforehand, I can then go ahead and cut the miters for the box and the edge bands will match up perfectly. Once the glue has dried, I use a hand plane to flush it up and sawdust and glue if there's any small gaps to fill. With the panels ready, I can tilt my table saw blade to 45 degrees to cut the miters. Since the panels are cut to size already, I sneak up on the corner so as to not remove more than I have to. The last thing to do before assembling the carcass is to cut the back panel, and this is out of half inch plywood. I also went ahead and drilled a hole in the bottom of both back panels for a grommet for the cables. Because I edge banded beforehand, these came out pretty good. With a little bit of glue and sawdust, they are nearly perfect. Miter joints aren't typically very strong, but with the back panel, these boxes are holding up well. Just in case, I decided to put some splines in the corners for extra strength. I decided to go with walnut splines to add a little bit of fun contrast. Now that I have the carcasses done, I can start working on the drawers for the left tower. I'm going to make these like I make all my drawers. Using half inch ply, I started by ripping down the sides and cross cutting them, leaving a little extra for the front and back as I will get the final measurement for that shortly. I then can cut a half inch dado to accept the plywood bottom. For this, I did three different drawer sizes, three inches, three and three quarter inches, and five and three quarter inches. To find the length of the front and the back of the drawers, I use the simple trick every time of using two pieces of wood and a clamp to fill the space in between. Setting up a stop on my crosscut sled can knock these out really quick. To assemble the drawers, I'm using pocket screws and they will be drilled on the fronts and the backs. But these won't be seen as the backs will be in the back and the front will be covered with a false drawer front. After assembling three sides, I can slide in the bottom of the panel before attaching the fourth. Before I installed the drawer slides, I gave the inside a final sanding and a finish of wipe on poly because it would be much easier than trying to work around the slides afterwards. While I was at it, I also finished the drawers. For easier installation, I used spacers for each drawer. Raising the drawer half an inch, I can use a two inch spacer for the bottom drawer to hold up the drawer slides while I install them. So right now I'm gonna start working on the false drawer fronts for the drawers as well as the door for the kinetic door. So this piece of half inch plywood here, I've already edge banded and got it ready for the drawer fronts as well as the door. I originally planned on having solid oak drawer fronts as well as a door, but with the kinetic door, I was a little worried about expansion and contraction with that. So that's why I'm going with a plywood front. I'm gonna cut out a bunch of pieces of oak like this and glue them onto the front in, in a cool mosaic pattern. I wanted to make sure that I have the stability of the plywood, but also have classiness of hardwood oak on the front. Before I cut the pieces for the mosaic pattern, I cut the false drawer fronts and installed them. Since the saw blade kerf is an eighth of an inch, I can use a paint stick to space the drawer fronts evenly. 
Since the fronts are getting covered by oak hardwood, I can screw the fronts on to hold them in place before I screw them in from the inside. For the mosaic pattern, I wanted to use thin pieces of oak. I started with removing material on the table saw before resawing it on the bandsaw. I did it this way because my bandsaw needs tuning and I didn't want the blade to drift too much. Because these boards are pretty thin, I put a sled in my planer so that the blades can go down lower. I wasn't going for any particular thickness here, I just wanted to clean up the saw marks and flatten the boards. I actually wanted them all to be different thicknesses so that it can give it a really cool texture on the front. Using the most dangerous tool in my shop, I cut some shapes that I made on the computer. Then I went ahead and used some spray adhesive to temporarily attach these to the board so I can cut them out. While resawing and planing these down, stress was released from the boards so they cupped a little. So when I glued these onto the drawer fronts, I used some CA glue in the middle and applied pressure to flatten them out. The CA glue was also able to hold these pieces while the wood glue set up. Because of the overhang, I had to trim up these edges so I used this trick on my table saw fence. With a piece of quarter inch ply and the CA glue and painter's tape trick, I could flush one side and then use the fence to do the other side. For the drawer pulls on the rest of the hardware, I went with a matte black look because I thought the contrast looks very sharp. The last thing I did with the drawer fronts was give them a coat of finish, but I'll talk about that later on. Before I started working on the kinetic door, I used this bench dog jig to drill holes for the shelf pins. And that takes care of the interior of the right carcass. Now it's time to talk about the kinetic door. The way this works is that there's three pivot points. While these two larger triangles stay still, the trapezoid and smaller triangles move outwards with the use of hinges so that the door can move. I went with some pretty basic bearings for the pivot points and I got those on Amazon. I have to start by cutting the horizontal and vertical lines here. That will give me two squares that I'm looking to use. But before I do that, I'm going to drill a hole where all these meet up so that the pivot point matches up for all of them. I drilled most of the way through and then I flipped it over to drill the rest. This will help prevent tear out. I'm using metal bearings for the pivots and you can see that it fits in nicely. With the hole cut, I can now cut along these lines to separate the pieces. If I were to do this again, I would probably stop right here and then cut around with a coping saw and then continue the cut so I can leave some wood for this corner so that the pivot point can have more to hold on to. At this point, I can start cutting the squares apart into the necessary pieces. I'm sure that there's other ways of doing this, but using painter's tape and CA glue, I lined up the piece on my crosscut sled with the help of a square to make the large triangle. Since I need parallel angles for the trapezoid, I can just use my table saw fence for this cut. With the large triangles, I drilled in the corners for the top and bottom bearing, and I was able to secure the bearing using some five minute epoxy. A note on this, make sure you have some good epoxy. I used some old stuff and the bearing ended up cracking off after some pressure. Once I used some brand new stuff, they held much stronger. The middle one is still fragile though, so be careful with that. That's why I said I would go back and cut a little extra wood for this corner so that it had something to hold on to. Now that the pivot points are done, you just have to install the hinges. Two hinges have to be installed inwards while the other two have to be installed outwards. You can see how they are installed here so that the trapezoid and the small triangle can be lifted outwards. I used T-nuts in the corner so that I can send a bolt through the bearings and secure it to the frame. I made sure to add some CA glue to the nuts so that they don't come loose over time. All right, I have this tower on its side here so I can start putting together this door. This door has taken me a lot of work here. And there's things to note is that I doubled up all the ball bearings that we have here. So there's two in each one, so I'm using six total. These doors only work with perfect squares, so you'd have to get a two to one ratio rectangle, and I thought that would look a little weird, specifically with the other tower. I thought this shape looked a lot better, so I installed this door here that has hidden hinges in it. The hinges you have to drill down a half an inch and this is half inch ply. Uh, so that's why they're poking through. 
but good thing we're putting those pieces on top because that'll just get covered up. So what I have to work on right now is that, you know, with that mosaic pattern, I have a bunch of pieces, but I need a piece that attaches to this one specifically, but not to this one. And it's gonna attach with a bolt going straight down through here. That will cause these doors to be fixed together, but also separate and they can swivel around the axis here. All right, after I cut that piece out, I was able to glue it onto the door here, and then I attach the top and the bottom together by putting a bolt through. So, opens like this on a swivel. So right now I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna glue on all the pieces, and then we can start wrapping up this project. There was a lot of cutting of these pieces because I had to be aware of the gaps between the shapes as well as the hinges. To account for the hinges, I used my Dremel tool to scoop away the area for the hinges to sit in. With all the pieces cut, I can go ahead and glue in all these puzzle pieces. Never, ever touch my puzzle. So I could get the door apart and work on cleaning up the edges, I had to cut some more of it so I can remove the hinges and it looked pretty gnarly, but I will clean that up. Because I'm working with angles, I didn't use my table saw to trim these up. I used a flush trim bit in my router to clear out the excess. I then went ahead and put a heavy chamfer where the joints will be so that they can move freely without rubbing against each other. I found this knob at the hardware store and I thought it would look really nice on this door. But the threading is too small so I thought I would try making the opening bigger. After drilling a bigger hole, I tapped the knob so that it can be threaded again. I was already thinking of different handles that I could use in case this didn't work, but actually this worked perfectly. This was a pretty good idea. I'm a genius. So after I clean up the bevel and the cuts in here, uh, everything lines up a lot better. Uh, you'll see that there's a lot more space for this movement here because if it wasn't, it would have closed up on itself. One thing I do have to fix here is that this keeps wanting to rub up against each other here. So I'm gonna put a chamfer on the underside of, of this. Now it's falling right now just because there's so much weight over here. When it's vertical, I think it's gonna be a lot better. The knob came in nicely and it, it looks nice, good, good movement here. I'm just gonna make sure I fix here as well as here so that it doesn't get caught on itself. So I'm gonna take this apart one more time. I'm gonna sand down everything, uh, put the chamfer in on the bottom, and then I can finish these doors, and this is pretty much done here. I went ahead and did that off camera, but now I wanna talk about the last piece for this project. Just as a design, I added a foot and what I'm calling an apron up here. These are made with the same 3 quarter inch ply as the rest of the carcass, and I started by cutting them into two inch strips. I did the same continuous grain with the miters as the boxes and I reinforced them with splines as well. To attach the feet and the aprons to the boxes, I'm using pocket holes which won't be seen because they will be on the inside. I also went ahead and used my biscuit slot cutting bit in my router to add some slots for some tabletop fasteners. I marked where the aprons were going to go so that I can make a sizable hole in the top of the box. This is so I can feed cables down into the box as well as being able to fasten down the tabletop. I used my jigsaw to cut out most of the hole staying proud of my line and went back with the same CA glue tape trick to temporarily attach straight edges so I can clean up these cuts with my router and top bearing flush trim bit. Now the hole is much cleaner. Even though this wasn't necessary as no one would see it, I would know it was sloppy so I cleaned it up anyways. With that, I can attach the apron to the box. And even though I cut the hole for the cables, I still couldn't get to the Z-clips for attaching the top. So I drilled a hole, and you can see I was able to screw in the Z-clips from there. If you wanna know how Z-clips work, have a look at my coffee table build as I show how I install them there. With the top installed, I can locate where to put the grommets for cord management. I made this template so I can use the same CA glue trick as before to make a clean hole. No, I'm not sponsored by any CA glue company, yet. I just think this is a great trick and I use it all the time. With my spiral upcut bit in my router, I cut the hole in the top, leaving a little so that I could safely use a saw to remove the piece. After I used a flush trim bit again and a chisel to clean up the corners, the grommet fit perfectly. Off camera, I also did the same on the side of a box so that I can add an outlet to the desk. 
I routed a groove on the underside of the desk and added some magnets for something a little extra. I hate when things get super messy behind the computer and all that kind of stuff, so that's why I'm doing this, making this channel so that all the cords can sit in there and be nice and clean. So I cut a slot in here so that if I have any cables that have to go in between screens or anything like that, it could actually feed through here and down into this channel and keep it all clean. Uh, with that in there, I have these magnets in now and I have a piece of metal. I can drop that in right there. So my cords can all go underneath here, keep it nice and clean and out of sight. The last thing I did before sanding and finishing is fill any knots with dyed epoxy. I am a huge fan of imperfections like this because I think it gives it great character. I did a lot of sanding, drawing with a pencil first to make sure that I got everything. I also decided to just break the corner slightly rather than putting a profile on the top. White oak is a pretty porous wood, so much so that you can feel it. I knew I would be touching the top a lot, so I wanted to use Aquacoat on the top to fill the grain. Once you get it in the grain, you wipe away the excess, sand, and repeat. Once that is dry, I can do my final sanding. I sanded through the grits starting at 80, working my way up to 320, and then 400 by hand. I sanded up to 400 because that is what is recommended for the finish. For this, I'm using Odie's oil. Even though I don't have much left, this was enough to finish the top because a little goes a long way. I used this on my Modern Code Hook project for the first time, and I think this is my new favorite finish. Once you spread out the finish, you rub it into the wood, and after a little while, you come back and buff it out. It not only looks good, but it feels good. Plus, it's super easy. Oh, you make it sound so easy. With that, all it takes is final assembly. This project hit everything on my wish list for a new desk. I wanted all the bells and whistles of a nice desk, but also to spice it up with something. So trying something new like this kinetic door, not to mention the mosaic pattern, makes this desk look awfully purdy. If you're new to this channel, hit that like and subscribe button and turn on that bell to get a notification when a new video comes out. If you like this project and you want to see more like it, I have a couple more loaded up for you right over here. If you have a question or comment about this project, please leave it in the comment section down below. That's it for now. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time in the Kev Bot Workshop.